and welcome to the Vector Software Testing Symposium 2023. My name is Jason Masters. I'm a senior field applications engineer at Vector. And today I'm going to talk about emerging coding standards, where I will describe what a coding standard is, how the C++ language has evolved, and how coding standards have evolved to meet the changes in the language, and then a little bit about how coding standards are enforced. So first we'll look at what is a coding standard, then have a brief look at the C++ language evolution, and then looking at some of the emerging coding standard rules. I could perhaps say guidelines here, but I'm going to use the words rules and guidelines interchangeably here. And then we'll have a look at uh, enforcement of coding standards. So the primary aim of a coding standard is to restrict the use of a programming language to a safer subset of the language. So we need to eliminate undefined behavior, behavior on constructs where the standard imposes no requirements. So things like dividing by zero, dereferencing, a null pointer, and so on. One of the permissible behaviors with undefined behavior is the program can carry on, ignore the situation, and carry on with unpredictable results, which is definitely what we don't want in safety-critical software. We also want to avoid the use of unspecified behavior, contracts that may behave in a number of ways, but it isn't documented as to which way that will happen. For example, the order of evaluation of expressions, and we'll look at this in more detail later in one of the rules. We want to limit the use of implementation defined behavior, behavior where the implementation behaves in a particular way that is documented. So for example, the whether a plain child is implemented as a signed or an unsigned data type and the size of basic types. Limit the use of locale specific behavior. So when the locale is set in a particular way, avoid poorly specified and easy to misuse areas of the language and guard against common bugs and pitfalls, for example, confusing assignment with comparison in if statements, and confusing logical and bitwise operators, where the code is perfectly legal and can, can compile, but may behave in an unexpected way. Uh, and also some um, clear use of braces in initializers, avoiding complex operations to make the code uh, maintainable and easy to read. We may also define a deviations process, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the enforcement section. And we may also define some visual coding standard rules to how code should be laid out, a naming convention to mandate how variables, classes, and so on are named. And we may also imply, um, employ some metric limits to perhaps um, limit the complexity of functions. And this will help us later on when we come to do dy dynamic testing of our code. So let's have a quick look at the uh, C++ language evolution. So the original C++ language standard came out in 1998 with a minor update in 2003. And since 2011, uh, there have been new language standards every three years. And so the language has changed in some simple ways. For example, keyword reuse, the auto keyword now means something very different to what it did in the original standard. The way we specify exception specifications for functions has changed. There are new features, lambdas, and four range loops. Enumerations have been improved in terms of types and scoping of them. And there's more complex ideas related to uh, efficiency, so whether to move or copy uh, objects. Uh, an early frequent objection to C++ was that it was slow. And it wasn't necessarily slow, um, but it's quite easy to write code that is very uh, inefficient, and that was the main reason for slowness and some of the new language features are aimed to combat that inefficiency. Uh, MIS released a C++ coding standard in 2008, and that was based on the current standard at the time, which was C++03. This means it's not particularly suitable for projects using what we might call modern C++ or C++11 uh, and later. Some of the rules aren't relevant, but there's also no rules on the new language features, no guidance on how to use them safely. There was a Autozar coding standard came out, uh, and this could be thought of as an update to MISRA C++ 2008. It's not an official MISRA uh, coding standard, but it follows very much the same approach, drawing from the original MISRA coding standard, uh, and also some of the other uh, C++ coding standards around at the time. Although it's from the automotive world, um, it's still intended to be a general purpose coding standard for safety critical uh, areas. And for the next release of MISRA, it merges with Autozar to provide a single uh, coding standard document uh, 
that will be reviewed and updated in line with the three-year language update cycle. So what are some of the coding standard rules that we are seeing in the new standards? Operations on a memory location shall be sequenced appropriately. C and C++ have the concept of sequence points. And in between sequence points, the exact state of a program is indeterminate. There's no set order of evaluation of operands. Only once the sequence point is reached are all previous side effects completed. For example, here, where we are uh, multiplying and adding the return values of three functions we call, we can ask ourselves the question, which order are these functions called in? And the standard doesn't say. We do know the return value of B and C will be multiplied together before being added to A from the rules of precedence, but it doesn't tell us anything about the order in which the functions are called in. And if our uh, program expects the functions to be called in a particular order, we may well be surprised when they're called in a different order. The sequence point, it's important here, is the semicolon at the end. The equals isn't a sequence point. So here we have a, uh, an issue as well where we're modifying and accessing I on uh, both sides here between uh, sequence points. Um, we may expect the uh, evaluation on the left-hand side is done first because we're used to writing things from left to right, um, but that's not the case. Um, I++ could be evaluated uh, either side uh, first. Although we know the I++ will be uh, evaluated before we call uh, the function, because the parameters must be evaluated, we don't know if that will happen before or after the left-hand side. But C++17 changes all of this um, because the evaluation of the right-hand side is now said to be sequenced before the evaluation of the left-hand side. So in C++17, this is completely deterministic. We know that the right-hand side will be evaluated before the left-hand side. It might not be the order we expect, but it is uh, precisely defined. And with C++, there may be a number of things being done when we're evaluating operands. We may be calling some overloaded operators, constructors. So it's not always easy to see what functions are being called. And the C++17 doesn't completely describe all evaluation. If we have a function call with a number of parameters, all of the parameters could be evaluated in any order before we call the function. But C17 does say that once we start to evaluate a parameter, we must continue and complete the evaluation for that parameter before starting to evaluate another parameter. This avoids the interleaving issues that happened before, where evaluations may have been done on a parameter and then some other evaluations done on another parameter before returning to finish the evaluations. Now, once we started evaluating a parameter, we must finish evaluating that parameter. But this does leave developers in a tricky situation, and this is why appropriately is used in the, the rule. If you write code that takes advantage of C17 rules, we probably need to make sure that no one can compile the code with a previous language standard, probably with some hash if defs in the code. And it also means that sequence appropriately is a little bit harder to enforce because now it depends on what conversion of the language we're using. It may be compliant with C++17, but not with C++14. So the developer has a choice, make the code compliant to C++14, but that may lead to bulkier and less expressive code. Advanced memory management shall not be used. Now, C++ doesn't have automatic garbage collection. Memory that's allocated must also be deallocated. It's not done automatically, and we can have memory leaks if we're not careful. Um, there's also issues with embedded systems, like what do we do if we run out of memory? Uh, quite often, allocating all at startup is the only way to mitigate this. But the miser rule allows the use of new and delete in the code, but anything else is regarded as advanced and disallowed. And the rule also mentions the C++17 um, stood launder. Uh, and this is also considered advanced memory management and is also disallowed. Copy and move operations. Deleted copy and move operations shall be declared appropriately. Special member functions should be provided appropriately. Class move and copy operations shall have appropriate signatures. There's a lot of appropriate in there. And this is because the actual requirements depend on what we want our classes to do. And there's a number of rules there that, that govern the combinations of copy and move constructors that can be defined 
and how they should be defined to make sure that classes behave in a standard predictable way. For example, it's possible to declare a copy constructor without a const reference. We could just have a plain reference. So the argument could be modified in the body of the copy constructor. Now, this isn't really what anyone would expect when we're copying something. We don't expect what we're copying from to be modified. So that's why the signature should be a const reference so that we know from our caller's point of view that the uh, object can't be modified. We may also have classes that shouldn't be copied. The class may have a handle to a specific hardware resource, and we don't want to have multiple instances of it. And classes that follow these rules fall into one of three categories, unmovable, move only, and copyable, which can optionally be copyable, copy move assignable as well. And there are a number of terminology that's introduced to make things easier to describe these categories of classes. And this becomes quite important when we're using them as base classes to making sure that the inherited classes behave in a consistent and predictable way. So the coding standards, as we've seen earlier, restrict the language to a safer subset. And sometimes that subset is incorporated into the language itself. So there's an Autosar rule that says that uh, variables shall not implicitly be captured in a Lambda expression. But the value capture default operator implicitly captures this. Uh, and there may be an issue if the this you're capturing has non-static storage duration. You may be able to access it uh, after its lifetime, uh, which would lead to undefined behavior. Um, and the implicit capturing of this in a Lambda is banned in Mr. C++ 2023. And there's a note in the rule reminding us that the implicit capturing of this by value is deprecated in C++ 20. User-defined identifier shall have an appropriate form so this rule restricts the characters that are allowed in identifiers to a subset of characters allowed by this the standard. It's not a naming convention per se, say, for example, mandating camel case, but it restricts what actual characters can be used. However, it does restrict macros to uppercase and underscores only. That's fairly standard. The issue here is the source file encoding and how this is translated by the compiler and whether Unicode characters can be used in identifiers. Most developers want to write source code in Unicode but it restricts how you can use Unicode in the identifiers themselves. So generally, identifiers can't contain symbols. They can contain you know, letters, numbers, but not Unicode symbols. For example, here, this is an identifier containing a Unicode ornate left parenthesis. This is not permitted, even though it will compile and run. This makes the code readable and unambiguous and also gets around the issue of the translation phase being implementation defined. So it's possible that not all compilers will treat the Unicode identifiers the same way. Volatile qualification shall be used appropriately. So the rule says what may not be volatile. For example, function parameters and return types. Um, while this is permitted as per the language standard, the behavior may not be well defined or understood. The rule also notes that in C++20, the use of, of volatile in some cases is deprecated, so may be removed from the future versions of the language. So this rule ensures not only the well-defined uses of volatile, but also making the code future-proof. Previous coding standards warn of ignoring return values from functions. In some cases, you may want to ignore them, in which case you can cast it to void, and that's suggested in the Autosar standard. However, there are some functions that don't do anything except return something important. And the whole point of calling the function is to get the return value. And these functions uh, returns must never be ignored. So the Autosar standard mentions not ignoring the returns from std remove, std remove if, or std unique. And Mr. C++ 2002 adds std empty to the list. And this guards against the developer expectation that std empty will actually empty the container. In fact, it doesn't. It just returns true if the container is empty. And this is a new language feature introduced in C++17. It also says that casting the return value of these functions to void is not acceptable. And the reason we would do that to make the programmer intent clear is a function that returns something, I'm going to ignore it. But this doesn't make it clear in this case. If you go and ask if it is a container empty and then ignore the answer, why did you ask in the first place? A cast to void seems to make the intention less clear. All non-static members of a class shall be initialized before the class object is accessible. This means at the top of the constructor body. 
And there's many ways to initialize member variables, and this has changed over the C++ versions with the addition of braced initializers and value initialization. There is also subtleties regarding the location of default on constructor, declaration and definition, which can change whether variables are initialized or not. The intent of the rule is that when the class is ready to do something at the top of the constructor, all the member variables are initialized to stop undefined behavior where basic types are not initialized and indeterminate. And it means the class is in a known predictable state. As per the Misra ethos, the guideline doesn't say how this should be done, merely that it must be done. The actual way it's done is uh, up to the developer. All variables should be initialized. Non-static basic type variables that are declared without an initializer have an indeterminate value and accessing these is undefined behavior. Thus, all variables must be initialized before use. The rule encourages developers to think about where they declare variables. Traditionally, we might have put the declarations at the top of the function and initialized them perhaps to zero. Initializing it removes the chance of undefined behavior, but if the value is read before it's being used, was the value we used sensible? Leaving the declaration of the variable until you actually need it in a later block, perhaps, may mean that you can give them a sensible initial value. Static duration data is always initialized, so it's always safe to access. If it doesn't have a specific value, it will be zero. But is zero an appropriate default value? It may be better from a functional point of view to initialize the data with a sensible default value. This is where dynamic testing methods such as data and control coupling are useful to make sure data available across components is accessed in the correct order. Okay, a bit about enforcing coding standards. So enforcing a coding standard is primarily done by static analysis. It's a range of techniques to inspect source code and detect issues without actually executing the code. Enforcement should be from day one of development. Enforce early, enforce often. Write some code, compile it, run your tool over it, enforce the coding standard, fix the issues there and then. It's very hard to retrofit a coding standard partway through development. And the correct enforcement depends on setting up the static analysis tool correctly and perhaps following the safety manual if the tool has one. Note that static analysis cannot prove the absence of defects and dynamic analysis may not be able to prove the absence of defects. Have we possibly tested all of the possible program paths and all possible situations the program could be in? It's not practical to follow all of the coding standard rules all the time. So coding standards usually define a deviations procedure for breaking the rules in a controlled and safe way. This may require documentation to justify why we're doing that. And not all rules will require deviations. There's a number of standard reasons why we might deviate and um, where we have to write code that violates the coding rules to carry out certain tasks. Interfacing with hardware, timing, memory constraints, interfacing with third party code, where we are forced to write code in a particular way. There's more to claiming compliance than just having an analysis report with zero defects that's run over your code. We need a compliance matrix to detail which rules are enforced by the static analysis tool and how we enforce rules that aren't covered. We may need tool certification. How can we be sure that the tool does defect defects that it says it does? We also need to review the deviations. Review the safety cases. Are the deviations actually needed? And has the code that breaks the rule been reviewed and checked for safety? In most places, complying to a coding standard is satisfying yourself that you've done everything reasonably practical to follow the coding standard. And if you have deviated from it, that there is safe justification for this. Coding standards are an important part of safety critical software development. They also need to evolve with changing language standards to ensure new language features are used safely. The merging of MISRA and AUTOZAR coding standard aims to achieve this. Thank you for your attention during the Emerging Coding Standards presentation. We looked at what a coding standard is, how the C++ language has evolved, how coding standards have evolved to meet the changes in the language, and how coding standards can be enforced. And I look forward to your questions in the Q&A session.